So let's get started uh, talking about Kant's, Immanuel Kant's, What is Enlightenment? Uh, the full uh, title of this essay is actually an answer to the question, What is Enlightenment? It was actually a um, project in a newspaper of, of the time, uh, an actual newspaper in the 18th century. I didn't really aware that there were newspapers, I guess there were, in the 1780s in Prussia. Kant is a, a German philosopher, a German-speaking uh, philosopher. He's a citizen of Prussia, subject, I suppose. Accurate of, of, of Prussia, which is no Germany yet. Germany is later, uh, 19th century, 18th century. Prussia is the most powerful of the German-speaking states at that time. And uh, a newspaper had uh, asked a bunch of uh, prominent intellectuals to answer this question, what is enlightenment? And this is Kant's response. There were other responses from, from, from other people. Uh, and, uh, you know, it shows you that this is a question that was in the air uh, at the time, a question about enlightenment. We'll, we'll talk, certainly talk about that. Uh, this is a class called the human person. And, and so our concern in whatever text we read is uh, the question of human nature. Some of the texts that we read will be very explicit in identifying themselves as texts that uh, are, are meant to be explorations of, of the question of what it means to be a human being or what is most essential about being a, a, a human being or a person. Uh, others are not so explicit, but, uh, but the reason that I chose all the texts is because I think they have something to say about that. Uh, perhaps this is one of those texts where it's, it's implicit rather than explicit. The, what is being said here about human nature but when we're reading text for this course, then uh, if we're aware that the class is about an exploration or into the nature of humanity, then, then certain expressions and words are bound to stick out and are things that maybe are things that we pay, should pay close attention to. And for example, if we look on page four, about 10 lines or so from the top of the page, uh, Kant uses the expression human nature. Uh, farther down that page, uh, close to the end, he talks about the sacred rights of mankind. Uh, those are kind of key words for a, a class in philosophy of human nature, the human person. And so I, I think that when you come across things like that, and, and even if they're not using those kind of explicit expressions, human nature or mankind or humankind or human being, that you want to look for those parts of the text that seem to be commentaries, or there's a signal that, the, that what is being said is, is meant to have some direct relevance to the question of human nature, what it means to be a human being. Those are the kind of things that we should be looking for throughout the course, throughout the semester. Uh, so enlightenment, what is enlightenment? Kant has an answer to that question. Uh, he says, beginning the essay, enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-incurred immaturity. There's two interesting aspects right away to that. First of all, the idea that to be unenlightened is to be immature. To be enlightened then is to uh, be mature. And secondly, that, that um, to come out of a state of being unenlightened, which I imagine is a state of darkness in some metaphorical sense, um, that that state of, of not being enlightened, uh, that state of immaturity is self-incurred. That is, we are responsible for it. We somehow choose to be immature. Or we choose to be unenlightened. And that to come out of it, come out of the state of not being enlightened, Kant says, it, all it takes is an act of courage. The very famous Latin motto that he ends that first paragraph with, sapere aude, dare to know, is motto of enlightenment. So uh, he sees uh, enlightenment as a matter of, of growing up, of, uh, of being mature, and, and, and that if we aren't, uh, that, that that is our own fault. One might say that for children, uh, immaturity is just built in. It's just by definition, they're immature, but for grown-ups to be immature is a fault, and it is a, uh, one might say, a moral fault, because it shows a lack of a virtue, lack of courage. 
So in a certain sense, to be enlightened, all we need to do is to have the courage to know uh, and w to courage to think for ourselves, because that's certainly what he's thinking of enlightenment as, is the, the willingness and the ability to think for oneself. Now, it's a very interesting idea that to, if we are immature and unenlightened, that we would that, that it's our own fault, that self-incurred, self-caused. Why would one choose to be immature? Why would one choose to be unenlightened? He gives us uh, you know, some reasons why we human nature might choose to be unenlightened. He says in the second paragraph on the first page, uh, laziness and cowardice are the reasons why such a large proportion uh, of men gladly remain immature for life. Uh, laziness and cowardice, well, it's a little harsh, but he goes on and says, if I have a book to have understanding in place of me, a spiritual advisor to have a conscience for me, a doctor to judge my diet for me, and so on, I need not make any efforts at all. I need not think so long as I can pay. Others will soon enough take the tiresome job over me. A lot of irony there is that either through uh, fear or through inertia, laziness, uh, we might choose to be immature because to be mature is a, it takes energy, it takes effort. Uh, and so it may be that uh, we have very good reasons for wanting to pass off the job of thinking for ourselves uh, to others. But is it just an act of will to become enlightened? Is, is it so easy for an individual just to decide, well, I'm going to think for myself now. I'm not going to rely upon authority figures, others to do my thinking for me. I'm going to think for myself. Is it so easy? Cast some doubt on that, beginning the last paragraph on the first page. He says, thus, it is difficult for each separate individual to work his way out of the immaturity, which has become almost second nature to him. Well, how do we learn to think for ourselves? It's kind of mysterious. Uh, you know, in our educations inside and outside the classroom, as young people and further on, uh, somehow we do gain the confidence and the resources to, to be self-sufficient, to, to at least think for ourselves and decide what it is that we think about the issues that confront us as human beings. But it's kind of mysterious, and, it, and it's very difficult to do for oneself or in isolation and and maybe that is one of the really important themes of this essay, is that uh, enlightenment is very difficult to achieve on an individual level, and that all of us depend upon others in one way or another in order to reach uh, enlightenment, in order to be enlightened. And he signals that on the, the second page, in the first full paragraph, he says, uh, contrasting the process of enlightenment on in the case of an individual with the so-called public, he says, there is more chance of an entire public enlightening itself. And this is somehow the social process of enlightenment, the communal process of a people, a nation, a political community enlightening itself is actually um, something that would be a much more, uh, a much easier process. This is indeed almost inevitable that is, the process of enlightenment, where viewed as a process, is almost inevitable if only the public concerned is left in freedom. And certainly that, that's maybe the big, first big abstract philosophical concept that we're, we're faced with. Of course, it'll come up again. Uh, Kant uh, is talking about freedom. In, in this essay. And, and here he's saying that enlightenment is almost inevitable as long as people are left in freedom. Uh, but then it becomes a, a question of what sort of freedom is he talking about and why does he think that freedom uh, leads to enlightenment? Now one of the uh, few, I think, uh, tricky or difficult uh, distinctions that he makes uh, in this essay it's this distinction that he immediately goes on to make between two sorts of freedom. And the kind of freedom that he's thinking of generally is the freedom of reason, freedom of reasoning, of thinking, of, uh, of trying to solve problems and, and come to the truth. He makes a very strong distinction between uh, the private use of reason 
and the public use of reason. And, and, and it's a little tricky, I think, exactly what he means in, in each case. But I'll try to do my best in explaining it, my take on it. Um, he says again, in the, this is the second full paragraph on page two, he says, for enlightenment of this kind, all that is needed is freedom. And the freedom in question is the most innocuous form of all, freedom to make public use of one's reason in all matters. And if there's one overriding claim that Kant is making in this essay, it's that the public use of reason must remain free. But what other uses of reason are there? And by uses of reason, he means thinking aloud, speaking, expressing opinion, hypothesizing, analyzing, criticizing. The public use of that activity must remain free. The private use of it, he says, uh, not only can justly be restricted, in some cases it probably must be restricted. So what is he thinking of in terms of the private use of one's reason? Uh, well, he gives some examples of, uh, of the kind of situations that one may find oneself in that would be private use of reason. Uh, he talks about uh, a clergy person, a clergyman uh, of some sort. Uh, talks about people paying their taxes. Talks about obeying orders in the military. The private use of reason in Kant's mind seems to be the use of reason, the use of our rational thinking faculties when we are uh, in the guise of representatives of institutions. For instance, the, uh, the clergy person, the, the, the priest, the minister, the rabbi, the imam, who, who, whoever it is, when they are acting as the representative of their particular church or other religious institution, they are, when they use their reason in, in that role, they are engaging in the private use of reason. When a person who is a member of the military uh, is using their reason as part of their role, their job, well, they are engaging in the private use of reason. And Kant says that, that when we are in, in those roles, that we can't be completely free in what we say. For instance, we can't be thought to be free to criticize or reject uh, the essential doctrines uh, of those institutions. Um, if we did so, we could no longer be said to be doing our duty as members and representatives of those authorities and those institutions. That would be the private use of reason. Now, the public use of reason, well, what is that? Uh, how do we tell the difference? He, he, he talks about, for instance, on page two, uh, when one considers oneself, himself as a member of a complete commonwealth or even of a, a cosmopolitan society and thence as a man of learning who may, through his writings, address a public in the truest sense of the word, uh, th that's the public use of reason. He talks in page three about a scholar addressing the real public, that is, the world at large, through his writings. That, that is, uh, the public use of reason is when, is when, when one is addressing the public. The private use of reason is when one is addressing a more limited audience. When a priest is addressing a congregation, giving a, a sermon, that's the private use of reason. When anybody, that priest or anyone else, writes a newspaper editorial or a letter to the editor and publishes it in a newspaper, that's the public use of reason. Really, the differentiation is, is about whom it is that's being addressed by the, the, the speech. And once again, Kant is saying that the private use of reason, it's okay to limit the freedom uh, of the people who are engaging in that. But the public use of reason must remain free. Now, the question of this essay is, is sort of getting at just why Kant thinks that is true, and that's what we'll take up in the next video.